Hey students, uh, Dr. Dan Stevens here. Uh, let me see, forgive my appearance first of all, it's my holiday attire. I'm actually recording this um, and, uh, because I received a number of uh, emails from students saying they give us some help on the uh, video project. So, um, here's, here's where I start. I actually, I'm using my laptop's camera, you can use your cell phone camera, whatever. I've already got a Gmail account established. I bring this up is um, because what I typically would do is I upload the video to YouTube, you know, sign in through Gmail, and then I'll, you know, I'm automatically logged in. You can upload it to YouTube and produce it there, and then that will actually give you like a URL or an embed code that you can turn around and uh, use in our discussion forum. That's the easiest way I've found. Uh, when I produce it, I actually make it unlisted, meaning that uh, only people with a URL or that exact code can see it. It's not publicly available. It's not uh, something people can Google and you know find your content. So people that have privacy concerns, you know, you know, for all it's worth. Um, now, just so you know, I prefer the embed code, um, you know, as opposed to the URL. Think about it. Whenever you upload it to the discussion forum in the repository where you're going to uh, upload your video project, um, you can either have a link that's that URL that people have to click and it takes you to YouTube, or if you use the embed code, it's like the uh, the programming code, and so that's where you see the video with just the play button. You know, I prefer that, so that way I don't have to go to web courses and then go to YouTube and back and forth and all that stuff. Of course, I'm grading 50 of these things, so maybe I'm biased. Um, it might get loud in here, just so you know. I'm <laughs> recording this from my house. Anyway, okay, topics can be pretty much anything we've covered throughout the semester, either before the midterm or after. You know, in the uh, city politics book, um, just pick a topic, and I'll, I'll show you how this works in a second. Or, of course, You've got the second half. We've been talking about the Dudley community and the Streets of Hope textbook. Um, just uh, for the side, you can also use any community. Uh, you know, given the success of the Dudley community, I offered um, to let you pick your own topic. Like if those of you that are actually outside of the area that have your own similar community and have found successes, you know, by all means, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just looking for you to demonstrate you've learned a lot in this course and you've seen and learned these lessons and this is your show and tell, right? Okay, so here's what I did um, as, as a demonstration to show you, you know, what I'm looking for. I went through the uh, discussion forums. I found a question, did machine politics help immigrants assimilate? Um, I can't remember which module it's from, but there you go. Anyway. So, um, did machine politics help immigrants to assimilate? First of all, you'd have to start with what is machine politics? You'd have to understand what we're talking about. And basically, we're talking political machines that provided an alternative to government and industry. They're informal systems um, set up by usually corrupt people, but um, you know, for their own selfish reasons, you know, for their own rise to power, but on the flip side, they actually did a lot of good, right? Um, they helped uh, masses that were flooding into our nation um, to to learn the ropes, right? People, you ever see the movie Fightful Mouse, uh, you know, a little cartoon thing? Man, my kids loved it. Um, Fightful Mouse gets off the boat. Okay, I'm going to help you out, but you need to vote for me. That's That was the exchange, right? So, um but think about this. How exactly did we get to that point? How how did that need arise? You know, um, go all the way back to the American Civil War. Okay, after the American Civil War, the, the hostilities ended. It was actually a spirit of they just wanted to reconcile. It was they uh, wanted to uh, have an armistice. Just everybody was sick and tired of the war. So many people dying. Just let's just quit this nonsense and move on. There were actually food drives up in the north. You know, they were trying to help because most of the, uh, you know, damage was done in the south, uh, barring like Gettysburg or whatever, but everything else was uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line. And so 
and plus they were the you know the the losing side was the South, and so they suffered pretty much the most. And so you know the North actually had a spirit of goodwill. You know, let's help these folks out. This is our nation again. We kind of settled it on the battlefield. There you go. So everything was all, you know, wonderful until John Wilkes Booth killed President Abraham Lincoln. So then all of a sudden that spirit of reconciliation became, okay, now we're going to pay you back. You know, uh, reconstruction happened, which is occupation. You know, the, the Northern Armies came down and occupied the South. You guys are petulant children. Well, we're going to show you what for. The occupation, the carpetbaggers, they came down and said, look, we're going we're gonna to make you, you know, behave yourselves, right? So because of that, um, basically every administration after the American Civil War up to 1900 was Republican, except for uh, Grover Cleveland, who had two uh, non-consecutive terms. Um, but everything else was Republican. Now, that bears mention because Republican is decidedly pro-business, less government, right? So you think about it. Um, this is this is what gave rise to the captains of industry. All these big, you know, the, the old school 1%, you know, Carnegie and uh, J. Paul Getty and whatever. Uh, these folks that rose to power, um, you know, they, they were seen as, like I said, the captains of industry, but at what cost? You know, the other 99% workers were a dime a dozen. They were cheap labor coming over from overseas. And so, hey, you know, if you don't, you know, work 15 hours a day for, you know, two cents, well, I got 18 other people that are willing to do that. So workers were really abused during this time. You think about it, like the, uh, uh, where was it, the Pullman uh, rail car strike in 1894. You know, it was after the panic of 1893, uh, this uh, Pullman, uh, they made rail cars, um, you know, because of this big financial panic, they decided we're going to look reduce wages and we're going to lay off a bunch of people. And by the way, we're still going to charge you the same amount of rent because workers at that time didn't a lot of times own their own uh, homes. You know, I owed my soul to the company store, you know, it was like, yeah, they've got a job, but they're just basically slave labor forever because they never could make quite enough to get on their feet, right? That's how these big major rich people came to power. Let me give you an example. J. Paul Getty, uh, one time uh, the world's uh, richest man, okay? First billionaire, oil magnet. Matter of fact, uh, he was the business partner of Henry Flagler. Henry Flagler is the one who made the East Florida East Coast Railroad, which is, um, of course, I have a, an alarm going off. Um, he's the one who made the Florida East Coast Railroad, which is now Brightline, our high-speed rail coming through to Orlando. So, it, you know, it does have something to do with us, right? Anyway, um, fast forward to 1973, his grandson was kidnapped. Okay, 1973, the the Richest man in the world's grandson, one of, I think, 13 grandkids that he had, was kidnapped in Italy. The uh, kidnappers um, wanted $17 million for ransom. However, <laughs> this rich old cuss refused to pay. He said, look, I have, if I pay one penny now, I'm going to have uh, 13 kidnapped grandkids. So he didn't want to pay the ransom. Three months later, the kidnappers cut off this kid's ear. Okay, a 16 year old, right? Cut off his ear and mailed it to a newspaper. Okay, making this guy look bad, right? So they dropped their demand to three million bucks and J. Paul Getty's accountants said, you can actually write off $2.2 million off your taxes if you pay it. So, which he did, he paid it. And then the father of the kid had to borrow the rest at 4% interest. What a dog, oh my gosh. So sometimes after his release, um, he called to thank him uh, for uh, paying his ransom, get him out, and the guy wouldn't even come to the phone. That, that's the kind of people we're working with, right? So back to the machine politics, these people felt 
powerless. You know, these are the kind of people we're working with. They were the 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 ultra elite of the 19th century. And so what happened was they just made their own informal uh, system of, uh, you know, assistance. Like, for example, you've got um, New York City had that Tammany leader, uh, Big Tim Sullivan. He's a big Irish guy. Well, he's a thug. He, he wanted power. Okay, admittedly, the guy had his own aspirations to rise to power. But let me tell you, he beat the system. Here's the good thing about him. He distributed coal, food, and rent money for all these uh, people that you know needed it, right? His private police department, by the way, police were not always just a government entity. You know, they had private companies that did this. So the private police department opened up as temporary shelters for the homeless. Uh, he helped expedite business licenses to ethnic shopkeepers. And uh, something I actually learned, um, he's the reason that we have Columbus Day to appeal to Italian voters, you know, hey, we're going to make Columbus Day a national holiday. You never knew that. So anyway, so you think about it. They rose to power. They had the pubs. They had the control over the pubs. They had the control over the things that mattered to the little guy. Well, most of these people, the machine politicians, so to speak, were basically students of the School of Hard Knocks. They weren't the highly educated people, the, the blue bloods or whatever. They were the people that just went out there and busted butt and made their own way. And they became symbols of success. And that's what appealed to the masses because they're like, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. So that was the power of the machine politicians. And so to answer your question, did machine politics help you know, the masses, the immigrants assimilate? Yes, I did. Anyway, that's what I would be looking for in a video. So as you go through, pick a topic. You know, you can see I've run on for 12 minutes here. Um, of course, I like to talk, and I also give you some instructions, so you got to give me credit for that. Um, sky's the limit. Go through the table of contents. Go through the discussion forums. Pick something and uh, see what you come up with. Okay? Look forward to seeing it.